Okay, Ken, I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. Maybe you give me a shout if um, if everything is okay and you can hear me clearly. You're good to go, good to go there, Marco. Perfect. Um, great. So uh, again, uh, welcome to everybody. Um, a lot of familiar faces here. For anybody who doesn't know me, uh, my name is Mark and I, I'm a GPO with uh, Kula for the last year and a half. Um, it's it's brilliant to see so many people on this call tonight because I'm sure you like like us all are a little bit um, kind of sick of these webinars now at this stage maybe and we'd love to be back out onto the pitch but um, it, it's fantastic to see that so many people are are here and willing to to try and um, gain some knowledge and I hope I'll be able to to do the next 30 40 minutes justice and you can pick up a couple of tricks um, or practical tips. Um, really, what I'd like to cover is. Basically, we've about about six weeks, hopefully, all going well till we're back out onto the pitch. And then we might have another four to six weeks before we can back to competition and playing some serious games. And I'd like to just kind of cover some areas, maybe what we can learn from the last lockdown, um, what we can hopefully do to mitigate some of the risks and, and really trying to just look at rather than just saying, you know, we just want to return to play more importantly. Um, that we actually want to return to to a high performance, and there is a bit of a difference in that. Really, doesn't take take any skill or any kind of work ethic or you know desire for both either players or coaches to kind of get teams back onto the pitch. There is a little bit more in it to try and get teams back to a performance level. Um, you know, after nearly six seven months of really kind of not doing a whole lot, and you know that that's kind of the trick. And as you go through this, hopefully, I'll be able to give you some practical tips. Um, you know, that might be able to fill in some little gaps in knowledge. If you have any questions, you can stick them in there into the chat, chat box or maybe unmute yourself. It shouldn't take any maybe longer than 30, 35 minutes. So I'll try to move it through it pretty quickly. And again, uh, at the end, then we can have maybe a couple of minutes questions and answers if you have, if you have any. So really what I'd like to cover tonight is, is as I said, the, kind of the lessons from the last lockdown. We're going to look at what happened after the lockdown. Can we learn from it? Do we need to learn from it? Um, really, as I said, please God, we're about six weeks out from going back to the pitch. So what should we be doing now? And then once we're back under the pitch, what should and, and could we be doing then? And finally, um, maybe an, an interesting subject, or at least it is for me anyway, is um, when, when is enough enough? When is enough enough? Um, we talk about the, the kind of the, the rule of law of diminishing returns and at what level do our players need to get to before we can say, OK, you're fit enough, you're strong enough, you're powerful enough, you're quick enough. Um, these type of physical parameters that we can measure and we can ask ourselves, OK, well, what level do I need to get to here? And uh, when once I'm here, when can I move on? I will try and hopefully I'll try and answer some of those questions um, to the best of my ability. So really for the lessons from the last lockdown, some of you might have seen this, these breakdowns already. So this might not be new to you, but just for anybody who hasn't, it's just important to look at the, the injuries that other organizations sustained. Now, we haven't got a huge amount of knowledge or data on GEA or LGFA or the Camogie, other than to say, I uh, have heard that the LGFA had a significant increases in injury claims last year. Again, I haven't seen how, what, how significant it is, but I'm sure if they're making statements like that, it was pretty significant. We can look at, I know there was some good data came out from the Bundesliga and the German League when they were came back. Um, basically, they had an increase of 225% injuries compared to previous years, which obviously is, is, is pretty substantial. The NFL, after their lockdown, you see in the top right corner there, you can see they actually had up towards around 400% injury rates from their previous lockdown. So very, very significant, massive increases in injury and we move on then like and we ask ourselves like well, why is this and why really should we should we care about it well th the reason for injuries is uh, it's kind of there's a numerous numerous factors in it there's we have this uncontrolled and, and non-specific training methods which i'll probably go into a little bit more detail as we're going through um we have the inconsistent training surfaces which again push, play havoc with our tendons and our ligaments and in general musculature in um in, in general and then we have these spikes in a training load, which kind of ties in with this uncontrolled training methods that we have, where some days we go out and we train very hard, other days we might train a whole lot. 
we might have three to four days between sessions. We could have a week or two between other training sessions. There's just no flow to our training, so our body can't adapt to what was, where, where to the levels we need to get. And in a sense, then, we're probably and most definitely not training the demands of the game right now. But that's not the end of the world, okay? And as I see, I'll, I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. But it is important to remember that the injuries do play a huge factor in losing games. As much as we wouldn't like to admit it, it is true. And there's been huge, huge money being spent in professional organisations to try and counteract this and try and collect data on it. Um, we haven't got as much in the GEA, obviously, you know, it was just because we've nobody really, I suppose, willing to, to put in the money into kind of testing it out and gathering the data. But we can all know from our fairly objective opinions and that you know yourself, you lose a couple of your your players and you can really struggle. And particularly, I know I'm speaking to a lot of kind of club players and club coaches here in particular, you lose some of your, your top guys, top girls, you're a different team straight away. So just to kind of hammer that point home, you look at the Leicester City when they won the Premier League and the top right is a, is a graph there showing the number of injuries each club had. Soccer is a very... Um, it's an excellent organization in terms of there's a, they have a huge database based on the injuries teams sustain and they all, every club has to put in kind of log their data when a player gets injured so over the course of that premier league when leicester city won as you can see in the top they had the, the least amount of injuries out of all the clubs played a huge factor in, in winning the the premier league definitely not the main reason and i can assure you that Leicester City and you look at those other clubs, maybe Liverpool and Man United, it wasn't as if I'm sure they were doing anything terribly wrong. So a huge bit of luck probably did play its part. But underneath that, again, you look at all the American um, organizations and the American associations, the NFL, the MLB, the NBA and the NHL, they are looking at it from a different angle. And an Irish company, actually Kitman Lab, Labs, have done a lot of work on this and collect a lot of data. And as you can see, just from the NFL alone, they've calculated that they lose um, $4.5 million every year to, to injuries. And they've calculated that every that each, on average, a team loses three games potentially to, to av avoidable injuries. I think that's the main thing, non-contact injuries, avoidable ones. And in MLB, the NHL, the NBA, they're all similar. Losing massive money, and more importantly, probably to them, losing numerous games, which could have been avoided. Um, so again, it probably comes back to the point about, about us in the GA. Like we sometimes we can kind of think that injuries is maybe it's just bad luck. And sometimes they definitely are just bad luck. But there is a huge element of our coaching and our actions, be it as a player or as a manager or as a coach, which can influence that one way or the other. And hopefully, I'll be able to go through with some some of those areas maybe that we might look at and try and improve upon. So the first thing is kind of identifying the risk. Uh, and again, we can look at how can we mitigate against it. So we need to look at, a, at the end in mind. And again, pretty simply, we need to look at what are demands of the game? Are we meeting those demands? After that, then we can look at maybe the key areas. And again, I'm trying to look at this from a practical point of view because we won't be able to fix everything. But if we look at the key areas and trying to develop like a sensible robustness plan. So if we look at the guy on the left-hand side here, so we are to say, okay, the hamstrings in general, they are the most injured muscle group. So of course we should be really focusing on, on trying to prehab exercises for those. The 23% I think of all injuries are hamstring related. 15% are groin related. So hamstring, when the injuries connected to the hamstring typically come from high speed running, which is a very um, risky action, but also a very important action in GAA. Groin injuries, again, where do they come from? Typically they come from twisting and turning and kicking the ball. Okay, so we'd have to look at again, right now, probably a lot of our players if we're football orientated, I haven't kicked the ball too too much, I'd imagine in the last seven, eight months. And all of a sudden, if we go back out to the pitch and we're asking them to kick the ball 100, 200, maybe 300 times in a in one training session, that is a massive spike in load, which we need to really look at and try to be sensible about it. Also, maybe sometimes we try to be too clever and we actually undercook our athletes. We try to maybe be too safe with them, and that can be just as bad as, as overcooking them. So we do need to stimulate our athletes. I think a, a good quote I heard there recently somewhere is that basically we want to have enough stimulus to, um, to set off in a smoke alarm, but we don't want to have enough that will actually burn the house down. And that's kind of what we're looking for, that real kind of that, um, micro-dosing our athletes, just doing enough, but make sure that we are doing enough. 
So here's a little checklist that I've put together for the next six weeks. Again, very simple. Hopefully it's pretty practical and it's something that you can like, come back to and just make sure that, OK, you know, because we, we can move away from these things and lose sight. And it's always important to come back to something just to reassure ourselves and reaffirm what we should be doing. So I would suggest for the next week, weeks before we go back onto the pitch, if you're a coach or if you're a player, look at the injuries you picked up last year. OK, after that, we need to look at start introducing some speed work. Now, again, um, and I will, I'll go into these in more detail in the next minute or two. We need to look at probably incorporating some tempo runs and some high speed runs and possibly some curved runs into our conditioning work. We also need to look at plyometrics, OK, and to building some reactive strength. I would imagine none of our athletes have jumped much in the last, we can come back to whatever, seven, eight months now since our last championship game. Um, and again, that is another huge area. Again, females in particular, but males are no different. They're just a little bit less likely, but they are likely to pick up some jumping related injuries and also uh, injuries to our tendons and our, our ligaments from high speed running. The, the ligaments are just in tendons, are not used to that force that's going through them, which they will experience when we start going into some high speed running. Again, general strength training. Again, it's probably some people have access to gyms, some don't, but there is a lot of strength work that you can do at home, which will help. Probably not perfect, but it'll definitely help. And then I'll go through some testing that um, might help develop some standards for your team, again, which I'll go through in more detail. I just have skill work in at the bottom because I don't want you to think that I'm uh, just pure strength and conditioning or let it develop. Like, that is my background and that is my education. But I, I go through this and I try to study this just so that I can do enough to cover the most important things in athletic development. Because my main interest is actually in coaching and I want to see how much time I can get as much time as I can actually coaching, spend as little time as I can on the athletic development side, but make sure that I am actually developing them correctly. So injuries, OK, again, hugely, hugely important because the greatest chance or risk you have to picking up an injury is based on uh, previous injuries. OK, so everything that you can do is basically if you are not fixing the last in the previous injuries you had, you are numerous times more likely to, to injure that athlete again. And that's just in a general year. Now, you take into account that we have done nothing for the last seven or eight months. I would imagine those statistics and those percentages will just go through the roof again. OK, so if you're a coach, um, you need to start. You really need to start communicating with your players and exact, seeing exactly where they are. I'm sure you will probably know what injuries they picked up last year. If you're a new coach to them, well, then I'd definitely be chatting to them and getting a general idea of where everybody is. You need to kind of stay on them because we can all get quite lazy sometimes with a rehab or prehab. And then you need to um, and they need to understand if I've athletes here listening that rest will not fix it. OK, you need to rehab it properly and then you need to start strengthening it up in a fundamental strength point of view um, rather than just general strength and the general strength is more related to maybe your deadlifts if you have a hamstring injury or maybe squatting quad injury something like that rather you need a, a real focus on the fundamental strength which is specific strength to those movements which again I will go through um, later on in the presentation from there then we need to quickly ask is there a return to performance plan OK, so rather than saying somebody, OK, I, I injured my hamstring, I'm starting to feel good now and you're jumping straight back into 100 percent training. That is obviously not a, a very wise plan that you might have. And you as a coach probably need to take uh, ownership of that because I know myself as a player and I know other players, we hate sitting out of training. And once we feel good, we always feel confident that we can jump back in straight away and then sooner or later and it'll usually happen sooner something happens again and you know you, you just there's nothing you can do about it okay so you got to remember you can't go from zero doing nothing let the hamstring recover um up to 100 percent flat out sprinting trying to chase somebody down in a small sided game or maybe throwing them into a practice match or something it's just not a wise move okay you will need to build up some gradual exposure in our athletes as they're coming back from injury and the bottom line, again, consistent monitoring throughout. Even when they're feeling good, you need to be always on to the athlete's case. Are you still doing your prehab? So really go some rehab then into prehab once they're back training and stay on it. Because as I go back to the first point, 
you will the likelihood of you re-injuring something is massive it, um okay and that is the, the biggest factor in injuring something is the previous injuries that you had so it's speed and agility okay and this is again one of the probably the least trained um aspects of physical conditioning at the moment okay but is probably the most important in mitigating injury and in particular hamstring injury but also improving performance so what i would say to anybody now at the moment be it athlete or coach this is a massive opportunity actually if you're just looking at performance enhancing i look at yourself almost like to train like a sprinter at the moment because you have time now that we will probably never have again because we will not be able to do this when you go back out into the pitch where you can train speed work and give yourself the necessary recovery to actually be improving out straight out spree, speed and that is that is massive okay and i know i don't you don't want to take this for granted typically when we do speed work and pitch sessions it's it isn't actually speed work okay as much as we like to t- tell ourselves it is it isn't because we're not giving our athletes enough of a recovery time um sorry there just somebody mute them so i'm getting some feedback thanks um so i really kind of a rule of thumb would that be if i run okay when if i run 40 meters flat out and then i run it again in a minute's time and the time it took me the first time compared to time it took me this or sorry the time it took me the second time is less than 95 percent of the time it took me the first time then i'm definitely not working speed okay so if your output drops below 95 percent of maximal effort then you're not recruiting enough to improve speed so in order to do that you realistically because we haven't got access to speed gates and we can't really measure exactly you know from one one sprint to the next have i dropped down a 95 percent improvement obviously we can't really do that practically so the rule of thumb would be to at least give yourself maybe three to four minutes at least between each sprint now as you can imagine this rarely happens in in when we're back onto the pitch but right now you can do that and i would you know implore anybody to do it because speed is in my opinion again it is only an opinion one of the most important aspects of getting to a high level of either hurling football or camogie um again it's a, it, it's a, just a game changer to have quick players on your on your team so as i said you need to expose gradual exposure to this and you need to be doing speed work at least twice per week so right now i would say again we're about four or five six weeks out maybe from back out on the pitch you could start this now i would suggest that you probably start at maybe no more than 300 meters per session and increasing that by about five percent per week so you do two sessions around 300 meters and then increase it by five percent now obviously i'm not suggesting that you run flat out for 300 meters you break that down maybe into four five six runs of different length and overall then in a session you'd only cover 300 meters it mightn't sound, sound like a whole lot but trust me when you do that and you are running at 100 percent um you will feel it again but more important thing you need to keep to stay fresh should i say throughout each run so give yourself that maximum recovery time in between and also i suppose sometimes i find you just want to put that last point in there don't dilute your speed work okay because sometimes we can be trying to be maybe too clever maybe throw in a ball or throw in some resistance or different types of things um and we dilute the speed work and all of a sudden then we're not training we're not training speed work anymore we're trying to maybe do some watered down version of a, of a running soloing drill or something like that so if you're going to tra- train speed and i suggest you should just focus on speed okay and again recovery period is so important don't have your speed turn into conditioning work by uh, doing a less recovery time in between which is the mistake that we all make so from there, conditioning, part of the fun part. Um, and again, okay, so I'll try and maybe move through these a little bit quicker now. So we want at least two times per week, okay, to improve conditioning. Um, again, we're looking for that 5% increase. And again, that's across the board, be it strength, power, um, or speed, you're looking to improve you know, about 5% and probably no more, definitely no more than 10% or else, or else you're going into this kind of peaks and troughs type of conditioning, which lends itself to, uh, to injury. I would... Again, maybe start around 2,000 meters at the moment, and that 2,000 may be reflected to uh, the high-speed running part of your conditioning. It is a little bit of an arbitrary type of number there because it's very much dependent on the level of people are at, but I think that's a pretty good starting point there, okay? And again, I'm not talking about you obviously not running 2,000 meters um, in one run. You're going to break that down 
into different types of, as I see here, it could be tempo runs or mass runs or long, slow, mid quick aerobic power, which I'll go into in a second. I definitely would suggest if you're a coach or maybe if you're the leaders of one of your teams that you look at having maybe some testing block, preferably probably the week, ideally if we're going back, maybe the start of April, the first week there, have say, okay, we're going to test then or maybe do a quick test in the next few days and then say, okay, in four to five weeks, we're going to retest again. You definitely need to give it at least four weeks, ideally probably five or six weeks for you to actually see them see improvements from your conditioning work. It's a fantastic level way of kind of getting some accountability into your players. Um, players enjoy being tested as well once they're doing kind of the work. They want to be tested and it can hold people accountable. And again, it can definitely improve standards. Um, I will say this and I'll go back to maybe when I move on to maybe the testing protocols in a second. You do want to whatever test you're choosing and there are numerous ones out there, make sure you're trying to pick a consistent one that you can do and be bear in mind that players will probably be doing this on their own. They won't have any real equipment um, and they could be doing it on a road or on a track. So again, you need to whatever test you choose, you need to keep that in mind. So quickly run through the different type of conditioning. And again, you could actually literally do webinars based on just conditioning alone. It is a bit of a minefield. A lot of people have different opinions on it. I'll give you mine and then you can basically choose from there. So first of all, I want to get my players up to a certain aerobic level before I start introducing small sided games into them. OK, and I say that because conditioned games or small sided games, whatever really title we want to put on them are fantastic. And that is 100 percent the level we want to get to. But if we start off with those and use them as our conditioning, we put a ceiling on our players very, very early. And there's some good studies done in this in the NFL where they're looking at the improvements from conditioned games compared to uh, your tempo runs, your mass runs. And they found that basically the conditioned games, your top players are still doing all the running and your less less fit players are continue to do to do less running. OK, and it's very, very hard to manage and progress those type of players. Also, really what I find with conditioning games is that you're just refining and you do need to refine their fitness levels to get it specific to the game. But it is very, very hard to kind of improve. Or as I said, you will only improve it to a certain amount. So if you can get your conditioning up to a high level and then you start introducing the condition games, you're really kind of, I wouldn't say the sky is a limit, but definitely that ceiling can move up an awful lot higher in terms of how your outputs and what you can get out of your players. So. Again, we don't want to get bogged down. I'm sure all of our players right now are very kind of aerobically fit at the moment. And, you know, probably than they have more than they have been in ever, I would suggest, because all they've been doing is running for the last five, six, seven months. They've more than likely been doing some one, one of these type of runs here, which is a tempo run or a mass maximal aerobic speed run. Could be your long slows, your 5Ks or your 10Ks, maybe mid quick. So that could be like your four minute kind of time trials your aerobic power, which is effectively maybe run between 30 and 60 seconds and try to cover as much ground as you can. Could be doing hill work. Um, again, you can use hill work for aerobic power or hill work for very good for speed work also, or fart leg, which basically means you're kind of interchanging. It could be a 10 minute run and you're interchanging the speeds of that throughout. It is a 10 minute long continuous run. Each one of these are equally will get the job done and will improve the, your aerobic levels, okay? But it is important to remember that they all can kind of do it in different ways and they always have, will have different results. Um, I use all of these and I think sometimes I use all of them because players get bored, coaches get bored. And right now I don't really mind what, what players do as long as they're kind of doing something. What I will say is now probably we need to be moving on to more tempo work, which tempo is kind of like 100 meter runs, could be up to 150. Um, because that lends itself to our more inclined at our high speed running, which we're going to experience through games. OK, um, again, the, the difference maybe between tempo and your maximal aerobic speed work is with tempo, you can actually the, the, the quality of your run is better, should I say, because you're getting a long rest period. So you might have to cover run at about 70, 80 percent over 100 meters. And you do that on the minute every minute. So you typically might take you 15 seconds to run 100 meters at that speed. Then you get 45 seconds rest. So your quality of run is an awful lot higher. You're running at a higher uh, height. It's more, it is a more of a high speed run that you will experience with your maximum aerobic speed work. Um, both of these will get the job done. They will improve your aerobic levels. But as we get closer to pitch work, 
I'm more inclined to go at my tempo. I have used max aerobic speed work to improve aerobic, and it is very effective at that. But again, it does, it's very time consuming and your runs, because it might say, for example, it might be a 15 on 15 off or a 10 on 10 off or 30 on 30 off, your, rope, your runs become very, to use a non-scientific word, very grindy, okay? Your, the quality of your running that you're doing is not maybe where you'd like to get to, okay? So you want to maybe use that at the start with maybe your long straw runs to build up an aerobic level. And then maybe when you're about four to five weeks out, start introducing more tempo work, which will improve the quality of your runs. And again, it'll increase the high speed running, which will help with your um, your hamstring robustness. Also, just right, right remember that, and it probably is something or maybe a thinking point that we should have is that most of our players are um, are going to come back in different levels and conditioning to us. Okay, and I probably won't go through this in much detail now, but we have to keep in mind that we could have players out there now who are training almost like professional athletes. And we have some players who will come back and they've probably been sitting on the couch for the last couple of months, maybe doing the odd session here and there. So we need to ask ourselves once we get back out into the pitch, what are we going to do with these guys who are maybe super fit and don't need a whole lot of running now? They need to move it, probably move into more quick tempo stuff in, in, in line with our conditioned games. And what are we going to do with our less conditioned players who are definitely not conditioned enough to start going into our conditioned games? Okay. I would suggest probably look at maybe where the overall standard of the team is. If 75, 80% of your team is up around good level standards, which I'll go through at the end of this presentation, it's probably best that you focus on the majority and maybe ask the minority of players if they're happy, maybe that you they need to improve their conditioning, that they might stay after training, do a little bit extra work with you. Because we need to understand that we don't, by, by doing all this extra work with our players who have done nothing else for the last six months, you've got a huge psychological fatigue on these top players, okay, and you have a huge um, chance of, of risk as well, physiological fatigue, okay, these men and women are just mad to start playing games, they've worked hard, they deserve it, they don't want to be going back into doing a whole heap more running just because four or five of your players haven't done anything for the last couple of months, okay, so it's, it's something to keep in mind and maybe have a plan for. The strength power work, maybe less, uh, again, it's probably because a lot of players haven't got access to gyms at the moment. Um, some do, of course, and some I'm sure are doing a lot of good work. Maybe this mightn't apply to us as much. But if we can look at that fundamental work, and I'll talk about our hamstring in particular and our calf, Achilles, um, fundamental strength work. There's a fantastic guy, and I know some of you have seen me giving presentations to the, particularly to the ladies section and the underage teams in Kula. He's a guy called David Gray and he's, uh, again, he's, um, if anybody wants to Google him and if you're looking for a program, he's selling some, some super work here at the moment that a lot of athletes around the world, top class people and top class coaches are, are going to. He'll basically fill in the gap which we won't get from doing our general strength work which is our deadlifts, bench presses, squats, all that kind of stuff. General strength is important to build size and muscle, which will allow us then to generate more force. But the fundamental strength will try and tie in that gap between what we do in the gym, what we do on the pitch, and uh, everything in between. As I said previously, your active strength, your plyometric work, and your jumps crucial again in order to, to allow our athletes to be ready for landing, jumping, sprinting, pushing off. Just another little point that I'll make is that I would, especially for GEA players, again, there, I, there isn't a whole lot of data on this, so it's really just my own opinion. And I, there is some talk about it from, from, from other coaches that maybe we should have a, a lower body focus. And I would, in terms of um, for every kind of upper body session we do, I'd be definitely be having probably two lower body sessions. There isn't a massive need to have huge upper body strength. Um, we definitely need some, okay. But the question is, how much do we need? And after that, then is it is it any is it necessary to be carrying extra upper body strength? What it will do is obviously upper body bulk. Your center of gravity is higher, so it might negatively affect your sprinting and your agility. Okay. So again, if we don't need it, we don't have to try and train it. Okay. The, the bottom part, velocity based profiling. That's the next level. If you're, uh, you know, if athletes here and you're, you are doing your general strength work and you're looking for an edge, this is the next level that all, most of the top inter-county teams now are, are tying in with 
Um, I'd imagine some top clubs are probably looking at this also. It's becoming very accessible now in terms of the, the equipment and that you'll need, and it's it's not overly expensive. It, this is this is probably where where every club team is going to be in the next five to six years, um, where we all have our athletes and they have a certain amount of general strength, but they're they're hitting that point now that that law of diminishing returns where the work that they'll have to put in to get a little bit stronger, a little bit fitter is unnecessary. And all they need to be focusing now is power, power, power and speed. Um, again, for any people who are interested in American football and college football, this is huge talking point over there now at the moment. If you follow Alabama, um, they obviously won the NCAA top college in America, brought in a new coach. All he did was velocity based training. All he did was speed. Um, he massive focus in that and they destroyed everybody. Best team in the nation by far, one of the best teams ever. And there's huge talk of this now. Now, we'll take that with a pinch of salt. Alabama are probably recruiting the best athletes in the world as well. So pretty much everything works when you're dealing with the best players in the world. Um, so when we get back on, out onto the pitch, okay, again, more so for the coaches to look at here. This is just my own opinion, okay, and it's something I'd be working off. So I'd probably take the last session I did maybe last intense session last year and just for for handiness sake I'd basically take 70% of that volume and start from there okay I would increase that then by about 5% which will lead us in then to being a pretty good place by the time we get to competitive action I would mainly start again there's there's a lot of kind of top coaches and smarter people than me who are suggesting when we go back on a pitch we actually only do one session per week we give our athletes huge recovery period in, in, in between but I know that's probably not practical from a club level you'd have a lot of people giving out so I'd say at least two sessions per week um, for at least two weeks and then you can start increasing another and try and have again if it's practical at least 72 hours between each session um, Typically, the damage is done in that second or third week. The body is very, very good at adapting and holding on like if you're falling off a cliff. It'll hold on and it'll hold on. But if you're kind of going in and you're going from zero to 100, I find, and it, kind of some literature will show you that it's really around that fifth or sixth session when you start to notice that players start to break down and things start to go bad. You'll definitely get away with maybe the first session, the second session, maybe even the third session. But if you're continuing on that path, it's usually around that second week or that fifth or sixth session when bad things start to happen. Also, again, I know we're going to be mad to play in challenge games. Just have a monitor your, your, the playing time of all your players. And I definitely wouldn't suggest having players playing, anyone playing a full game if you can get away with it. Again, it's not always practical, but it's again just something to keep in mind. <clears throat> Small-sided games. I know Ken did a good presentation last week, and uh, you know it's, it's it is the big buzzword in G at the moment, the conditioned games. Um, understanding the the differences in the, between the size of the pitch, maybe that you're working in, would be important. So if I have a twenty by twenty grid and I have a four by four game in the middle of it, that's a huge agility focus to drill. Okay, so that means then that your grinds are going to be coming under a huge amount of stress in that. So we need to kind of expose our athletes to that gradually. So if I was doing a four by four game last year and it's going for four minutes and maybe giving my athletes 90 seconds rest in between, I would probably start that off maybe at maybe just one minute, okay, maybe 90 seconds, expose them to that, again, give them a good break and then go again. The same can be said if I was doing a 20 meter by 60 meter four by four game. What you're looking at there is high speed running so that in effect then is exposing your hamstrings so it's interesting to see how each game can really expose um, your, your different musculature to to whatever is relevant that's going on in in that game um, so again high speed running uh, 20 by 20 by 60 meter uh, pitch okay you know that your hamstrings are going to get a good workout there so again you need to be conscious that if you do too much of that super chance that your hamstrings are going to be uh, pulling up at some stage. The recovery strategy, and again, I will go through this in a little bit more detail in a second, I would suggest having some sort of recovery protocol um, that will make the players aware for the first four, four weeks. Some of these stuff, again, at club level is is not sustainable. Okay, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. We, we can start this stuff and then 
it kind of goes out the window after a few weeks. But I'd really, really try to put a huge focus on this to highlight to the fact that recovery is so important to our athletes and ourselves as coaches to remind us for those first really, really risky three to four weeks. So again, this, if this is a typical session. Again, this is a kind of a program I did for a, a different webinar last year. It's fairly applic applicable here. So this is my typical session from last year where we kind of were at the height of training. I would basically just take 70% of this. I would do each one of these exercises, but I would just probably work off 70%. The intensity I'd keep up reasonably high as well, as long as they're coming back into the pitch session, having done the um, tempo runs and your high speed runs now at the moment. Okay, so you're kind of taking that into account also. I've just done a little kind of um, breakdown here maybe of just some little boxes that we need to tick to remind ourselves when designing training programs and what we should not try to have included in it. If you can have all these areas here included in your training or in your training session, then I think you've you've ticked a lot of boxes, okay? And you, you know, you've, you've done your best. Nothing is ever perfect. We definitely can't get rid of all injuries. You know, and of course we can't give a perfect template to allow our athletes to perform the best. But I think if you can tick these boxes, then you'll go a long way to try mitigating all the avoidable injuries and also really helping your athletes to get back to that high performance level, which of course is is crucial for us. So again, 10 minute warm up. Um, pick anyone you want. Sometimes though we change it up a little bit now and again. Again, I have it in there just to, it's fairly obvious one, but we really need to have a good focus on our warm-ups now at the moment because players will be absolutely bursting to get back out to the pitch and sometimes we just need to put a bit of reins on them at the moment before they start kicking a lot of footballs and make sure they're warmed up before they start sprinting agility work make sure that everything everything is warmed up their core temperature is high and whatever area you're going to be working on that night that you've really focused in on that in the warm-up put in some plyometrics like the picture here on the left your pogo hops your jumps um, stick them in and start low low with the money maybe do a couple of jumps a night do a couple of more jumps the next night but definitely have them in there. Speed and agility, as I went through, have it in at least a two times per week, okay? I'd probably maybe do speed work twice a week and then maybe agility one night. Sometimes you can do both together. Again, just change it up. There's so many variables you can do in these. You can kind of keep it interesting for the athletes while getting some good work done. High speed running. Um, like again, it depending on the level of your teams. As I said, we all want to get back to the point where we're just kind of doing an awful lot of conditioned games. If your team is in a good state then your high speed running can be included and again it'll come down to you how you design your your drills and your games can you include some high speed running in your drills which kind of tick that box if you're not comfortable with that and you feel like your athletes maybe are not uh, you, they're not at that level yet well then i'd say keep your trainings a little bit more structured at the start so that your high speed running is structured and it's done maybe without the ball and then done without not in a conditioned game and ease the players into that as I spoke about the condition games, you'll be large in your small areas. Take into account you need both, but again, expose them gradually to both and understand what exactly is happening with each in each drill. The sufficient recovery, I think that goes goes without saying, you know, don't be trying to keep their heart rate up too high. Give them a sufficient recovery, 60 seconds, maybe even 90 seconds at the start. Let them bring their heart rate back down. You don't want their heart rate up in that kind of red zone where they're absolutely gasping bad things happen when it's up in that zone, okay? So try and keep them out of there as much as possible. And a little thing then that I start, start to do myself now with some teams, and I do a lot of myself as a player, is to kind of have, rather than just doing maybe a 10 minute typical cool down where they do a few stretches where there's very kind of little evidence out there at the moment that that actually is, has any benefit, I'd use that kind of cool down time to do some exercises like get some hamstring isometric work in, maybe every player has a role or just getting to bring it to training and you do some single leg hamstring work um, after training instead okay and it can get real bang for your buck there because if you try and do some strength and hamstring work in particular maybe the next night you're increasing the chance of picking up injury at your next training because you do need a lot of time in between sessions um, from when you actually try to strengthen up your hamstrings to the next point or when you're actually trying to sprint on them you don't want to have your hamstrings in a weakened state when you're going to sprint on them so here I'll just kind of click in, hopefully these start play for me, maybe Ken can let me know if they don't. Just a quick kind of videos that I've stolen off the internet there to kind of highlight what I mean by some of these drills. Um, so this is kind of some pogo hops, which will help, it will help the, the reactive strength of athletes.
and hopefully this is playing maybe can you can give me a shout if it's not there or somebody else so again he's an excellent athlete ankle stiffness tendon strength okay very very important similar to these exercises are put in right after your warm-up um, from here then i go on to if we can just open it up um i want to show you some mass runs again i'm not sure who this team is but just for anybody who's not sure what mass runs are they're kind of every each one of these groups is running out to a different cone and you usually break up your teams into three different uh, lengths and your top players or your fittest guys will be running out a little bit farther than your your less fitter guys or girls um they are carrying footballs in here probably wouldn't overly recommend that um but it is something to think about So you see the team on the right are running out a little bit further, the team on the left, and that's where mass runs can be quite useful, that your, your fitter guys are actually being pushed at the exact same level as your less fitter guys, and that's really the, the premise of mass runs. So if you don't understand that, maybe you can just Google it or ask me after if you want to go more in detail about maximal aerobic speed running. Okay, so again, um, I just want to show you some cognitive agility. And again, the, the agility maybe that we, we use and what we think of agility, which is running out to a cone um, and turning at that cone, that is in a sense agility, but it isn't true agility, okay? And I suppose the term is it's not, uh, it's not cognitive agility, which is relative to field sports, where you have to make a decision based on what's going on in front of you, and then you got to react to that, okay? A lot of studies are showing that elite there's no difference between elite and sub elite athletes in terms of running out to a cone and turning okay actually sub elite athletes are just as good at that as elite but there's a huge discrepancy between elite players and sub elite based on their cognitive agility and that is really kind of the x factor players and that's really the, the area that we need to improve on so here's just a good video i really like this drill some of the players here probably have seen me doing this already um where you're basically, it's just a box drill, it's a 1v1, and you can do so many variations of this, maybe throwing in a football, have the player coming from a longer distance, uh, make it more specific to football or hurling, and so basically this player coming at you has to try and touch you in a 10, 10 v 10 box. Great fun, definitely include this after a warm-up, gets the players, the players really enjoy it, and you can make it very, very competitive as well. Again, this athlete has to judge of what's going on in front of him. You've got deceleration, acceleration at high speeds, pushing off. Then you can go 2v2 with it, create a little bit of carnage, a little bit of chaos. Okay, and again, very specific. Okay, um, so hopefully that played okay for you. So from there, then we can look at our flying 50. So this is some speed work. Um, so sorry, this is flying 30s. So when we do speed work in the GEA and playing hurling football, camogie, we don't always start from a standing position. And the running technique used can be quite different from starting from trying to sprint from a standing position, maybe a walking position, or maybe a jogging position or a half pace run position. And we do need to train each one of these modalities. So this is like a flying 30, okay, where you start maybe jogging out for about 10 meters and then you just put the foot down and you fly off for 30 meters. It's extremely good for developing high end speed. Okay, so hopefully you get the, the general idea of that. Um, the next one that I want to show you is just a little condition game. This is on our tactical app. Again, hopefully this plays okay. So this one talking about a 4v4 game in a 20 by 20 box. So again, as I said, this works in agility. But I'd also say if you get to a point maybe where your teams are, you, they're, they're, they're well conditioned and, and most of your trainings now have made up of conditioned games, you can start adding in maybe some high speed runs into this. Okay, which will give a, in, 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 should I say, increase your fitness, but also making conditioned runs and maybe very specific. So if you want to say, okay, we're going to practice transition from attack into defense or defense into attack, then every time maybe a, a team scores, they have to, or two of the guys, maybe one of the guys has to sprint back 
maybe back to the halfway line and then they can join the game then or maybe two guys have to go or maybe after every turnover a different player has to go just different ideas you know and again you don't have to do it specifically this drill it's just to get you thinking about how we can add in high speed running into our condition games without kind of doing the whole boring stuff at the end of training which isn't necessary but again there's there's a limit on it as well So again, that's 4v4, just in a 20 by 20. If I, so they're working on agility and they're working on their grind strength there and grind development there. It's been exposed. So if I move these goals back then, 20, 40 meters, sorry, 40 meters, we're going into more high speed running then. Okay, and there is a lot of data on this and all the GPS has been done on this to show that these are the kind of distances that you'll be covering. Very, very relatable to hurling and football and camogie. Um, so again, just quickly then, I'll go through a couple more videos here. Um, the velocity-based training, this is a quick video just to show you how it, it can be a great tool and maybe somebody's interested. If you are, just you can just Google velocity-based training or there's a lot of research and data on it at the moment, but just to give you a quick clip um, of basically a typical, typical back squat. He's trying to generate as much force as he can and each rep then it comes up on an iPad or your phone exactly what speed that you're moving at the bar. So that obviously the higher speed that you're moving at, the more force that's being generated and more speed that's being generated. But you can only probably move on to this type of training once you have that general strength block in between. OK, um, again, most inter-county teams that I'm aware of are using some form of this. I know Limerick, Mikey Kiley and Limerick are using this now an awful lot. They have their certain standards for what a, they want their players to get to in terms of what strength levels they want their players at. And once they're at that, then they're very much just moving on to velocity-based training. Uh, he, we don't know, and I didn't ask what his strength standards are. I, I, I really would love to know. I've come up with kind of my own from what I've seen, but I'd be very interested to know if they're in line with what, what he's seeing as well. Um, this is something I do at the end of our trainings, our prehab work for our hamstrings in particular, because as I said, we can't fix everything, but let's go after the areas which is injured the most, which is our hamstrings. So I like to do this at the end of each training session and also include it in gym work with um, developing some single leg ham hamstring strength. Uh, so again, you've got single leg, all you need is a roller, get your players in after session, get them to hold this for 30, 40 seconds, single leg, maybe do two sets of it. And then they can go do their general strength or their general stretching if they want. If they like to do that and they feel they need to do that at the end of the session, then they can do that and let them home. And that's a great, great finishing exercise to do. Be a huge bang for your buck with that. Uh, so that's our videos. Oh, hopefully I can go back, sorry, to our drills. So nearly there now, you'd be glad to know. So finally, then some monitoring and recovery methods that are very, very user friendly. Um, you've probably seen a lot of this already. Most inter-county teams are using them, a good few. Most probably clubs are using these as well. They are great once used correctly, but they can, on the other side, they can be just a fantastic way of collecting data, which nothing is ever done with. So again, probably, as I said, maybe if you want to do this, just buy into it and get the players doing it. They're only going to do it for a couple of weeks, unless you have somebody really full-time S&C coach with you who loves this stuff and wants to collect it. Um, otherwise, I'd say, you know, just do it and really cover the most risky weeks or your first three to four weeks. And after that, then, OK, fine. Um, the top one is, a, is just a wellness questionnaire. Um, or sorry, the, the, the bottom one, sorry, is a wellness questionnaire. So players have to fill in an app on their phone and it goes into a Google Sheets. And then you can check it every day, maybe before training to see if your players, you see here, if they're in a red zone, if their green is good, red is bad, it means maybe that they had a bad night's sleep or they're feeling bad or they're feeling sore. Again, that all ties in an increased chance of, of um, not training well or picking up injuries, even worse again. OK, so again, it's, and again, it's a good talking point for, for coaches and managers to, to bring up with their players if they think something is wrong. You'll have probably maybe 10 questions that each player will have to fill in each, each morning and they can just, you will then basically be given a notification of wh where each player is at. Um, the recovery checklist, again, is a scorecard, which I find quite good. But again, there's a very much short timeline on this as well of how long players will actually care about this and actually do it. Um, it means that you have, say, that the, 
you just pick 10 of really important recovery strategies that you want your players to do over a week and they get a different score for each one and then at the end of the week they can get a, an overall score of how well they did on the recovery um, like sleeping you got over eight hours sleep you get 10 points if your nutrition is spot on maybe you get 10 points if you go for a recovery walk maybe you get four points this type of thing okay you can get adding stuff into it it is good but again as i said it'll only work for a couple of weeks and then players will not care about that anymore and coaches will probably care even less the rp by the time again good for coaches i find um the rp is re- re- the rate of perceived exertion by the time of the length of minutes of the training session. So if you want to maybe just take four or five of your players rather than trying to kill yourself, taking everybody's score, take four or five guys of various ability and standards. Don't ask them all together. Just ask them individually. Okay, how did you find that training? They say, oh God, that was a five out of 10 in terms of toughness. Then you say, okay, the training was 60 minutes long. So that's five by 60. So that's 300. That gives you 300 units. You go the next night then and you find out you ask the players and after that you hear, oh God, that was a, I've got 500 um, units of that training session. So that would mean then that you've had a huge spike from your Tuesday night session to your Friday night session. Then maybe on a Sunday you go back down again and maybe you're only doing 200 units and that's the rate of units you give, which will tell you how tough the training session was. And then it will print out and you get a little graph for yourself here and you'll notice, okay, have I got a load of spikes and troughs in my training here? Am I actually hitting what I want to be hitting? If I have a load of spikes and all of a sudden I go really high at one session and come back down, it's probably not a good good place to be. You know, as we said, just the spikes in training are one of the main reasons why players get injured. For every, I think, 50% spike in training, there is an increase of 38% chance of picking up an injury. Again, these are just kind of stats. I don't know who came out with them, but um, it's just something to keep in mind. The other side of it then it might show you if different players are giving you different results how one player and players might be start carrying fatigue from one session to the next if you thought a training session was only maybe should have been a six or seven out of ten and all of a sudden your senior players are giving you a nine or a nine or a ten out of ten well you know that these lads either your training session is not how where you thought it was or these players are carrying fatigue from one session to the next which again is something you need to monitor and get under control but I should say by no means am I suggesting that we, we need to be kind of undercooking our players and we're not trying to undertrain them. What I would say is I absolutely we need to get our players up to a really, really high level, but we need to get up there and expose them to it gradually. But once we're up there, we can we're very, very adaptable and we can actually stay at that high, high level for as long as basically as long as we want because we get into this this rhythm of training where our bodies were used to training hard and that's exactly where we need to get to really really high intensity training sessions but the problem is we just can't and we need to avoid trying to go up there and come back down again go up there and come back down again and do the odd session here and there because that's the spikes we need to we need to um try to avoid so again our last quick topic now hopefully i'm running maybe running over time a little bit here but the testing and what, what when is enough is enough um, and what type of testing could we be doing at the moment considering we haven't got a lot of technology or equipment um, so all of these tests will, will basically test your aerobic ability and that's that's nice to have again aerobic ability is a hugely important factor in camogie football and hurling okay you, there is no way around it you need to have a strong aerobic base but how much of a strong aerobic base do we need to have what is the limit we need to get to that's a question I'll come on to in one second the different types of tests we can be doing at the moment and I know you've probably all done these we've got a 1k test got a 2.4 kilometer test or otherwise known as a cooper test you go to a 5k yo-yos 30 15 broncos etc okay we've done all of these what i would say on d at the moment is what is applicable to what we can actually consistently measure considering we're not coming there looking at the players and they haven't got a huge amount of equipment they don't know how to measure out certain distances or they might know how to do it and they might know how to cheat which is even worse um, so what is the most consistent one? Again, I have no issue. I, I'm doing right now a lot of teams is a 2.4 kilometer Cooper test. Um, I think it's an excellent way of testing aerobic ability. They can, players can do it on Strava and put it into their groups. You, there's some good data on it to tell us what is what levels we need to get to. And it's very, very hard cheated. Um, and again, we don't need to, the players don't need to measure out anything. Which are Broncos and which are Yo-Yos and your 3015s? They are excellent tests, but I, I've just seen so many players kind of 
give in kind of really, really weird um, times on these, basically, because if you're just one meter out and measuring any of these tests, it will absolutely completely change the, the score that you're going to get on the test. So one kilometer, 2.4, very good. The one kilometer I used to do an awful lot, um, probably moved on to 2.4 a little bit more now because I think the 1K is maybe a little bit too short to term aerobic ability. And I've seen too many kind of averagely fit players just really grinding out a half decent 1K time. And maybe it might be a true reflection of aerobic ability. It's very, you can't really grind out 2.4 decent time. The strength, you can do push-ups, pull-ups, hamstring curls, where you're testing how long can you hold a hamstring curl like that guy was doing in the video, maybe um, for single leg work. Again, hugely important to your plank. The power work, um, there's a very good app, My Jump app, which you can get on your phone or your iPad. Very, very consistent, well-researched, and it'll tell you basically your power output in terms of how high you can jump from a, from a standing position or your vertical jump which again, players love, massively important in terms of our, uh, measuring power in our players. So to move on from there, then I just want to give you some breakdown of all of this. What I spoke about is how much is enough is enough, okay? And what levels do our players need to get to before we can say, yeah, you're probably strong enough here now. There's no value in you being any stronger. Um, you're probably fit enough. Or your, or your aerobic levels, should I say, not fitness. Your just aerobic ability is probably high enough. I don't need you to be really bursting yourself and hitting kind of those laws of diminishing returns where if I run a 10 minute 2.4 kilometer time and I really just want to add on or take away another 10 seconds off that, I might need to train three times a week to do that and spend a huge amount of effort on it, increasing my chance of picking up injury um, time that I could be using on other areas. And I'll come back to this graph here, which is a little spider graph, which is a great tool. Um, I won't read too much into the, the headings they have here, but like if you have like your aerobic level, um, so you have your strength level, you could have your skill level, you could have your speed and your power. Okay, and you give you, you, every all of these are measurable and they're all uh, subjective, sorry, objective um, rather than the skill, which is probably a little bit more subjective, but you can still pretty much a good score in here. And what you really want to do is try to fill each one of these up as much as possible. And once it's reasonably full, you do not want to spend any more time on it. And that's the big question we all need to be asking, like, is how strong is strong enough? Once I get out close to that high speed or high end strength, well, then I don't really need to be training that anymore. There's no value in me going to the gym three times a week trying to improve my bench press by just two or three kg, you know, for the sake of it. Get away any value when I could be using all that time out practicing my skills or getting a little bit fitter or more powerful. Okay. So, as I said, they're, they're doing a lot of work at this in, 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 in the NFL or more importantly, probably more so in the college game where they have more access to their players over a greater length of time. And this is the, the results that they're coming up with. This might look like um, just numbers now to maybe a lot of you, but we need to be looking at probably more so the skill aspect. They've broken down their American football players into three different positions. Their skill positions are semi-skilled and this, their linemen. Okay, and we are, we're GA people are probably more applicable with our skill players here and they've gone down their, their body weights and what depending on your body weight what load should you be lifting in these general exercises so if you've got a skill player here and he weighs 220 pounds which is about 100 kg an average score for them would be uh, 1.33 of his body weight okay and that's the standards that they are setting whereas for a good score we're looking at 1.58 um, of your body weight. So that for me, if I'm 100 kg, unfortunately, I'm not far off it. I need to be benching 158 kg to be in, hit that good bracket. And I certainly wouldn't be hitting in that good bracket. Um, but they're also looking at how strong is strong enough. Okay. And that's the thing. A lot of the, what they're saying at the moment is a lot of their strength work, they're happy enough that all of the, their players they found from their research looking at the relative strength to speed output that they are happy once their players get into this good bracket here and they're not actually trying to get their players into the elite because they found that this gap here between your good and your elite numbers, that's where really the, the kind of that line of diminishing returns comes in where the amount of training you have to do is not reflected in your outputs in terms of your power and your speed. It's good numbers to have because it gives players and again in the GEA, we, we, it's fantastic for us. So here's something that I've kind of done through myself quickly. And again, this is my last slide, I promise. Um, looking at the areas that we can probably test now at the moment. Okay, so these are all 
you know, they're all very, very simple tests and where I think our good, our average and our elite players are at and where maybe we could get to. So if I just take, for example, maybe that Cooper test. So again, if I have 75, 80% of my players and you're in kind of less than a 10, uh, 10 minute 30 bracket, um, or if they're, sorry, if they're down around that 930 bracket for the t for the Cooper test, then they're pretty elite, okay? But within that, I would say looking at some of the data I'm getting in between club and county players, I would probably wouldn't be forcing my players to get in down around that 930. It'd be good to have them there, but I'd be pretty much happy enough if they're all around 10 because I don't see a huge amount of value uh, once they get below around 10 um, minutes, kind of around that 9.45 minutes bracket, okay? Their outputs don't seem to change, they don't seem to be running any, uh, their high speed run doesn't seem to be changing too much, and their performance levels don't seem to be changing too much. So again, it's a good kind of number to have. Same for our 1Ks, um, again, you might have, this is based on kind of the 100 metre where you have to turn into 1K. Again, anything kind of sub between 3.40 and 4 minutes, I find to be, that's the level that you, you could be at, you should be at. Anything less than that, it's going to take a huge amount of training to get less than 340 on it. And is there much value in it? I would argue probably not. Getting most of your time in around that good, most of your starting team in particular in around these times, that's where you, you the kind of that, that sweet spot where you need to be and trying to fill up the cups and across all of these areas. Again, same for the men, which you can see down below. Okay, from the from the squat and the deadlift, and particularly I would, I'd say I'd focus on the squat. There's some excellent research coming out at the moment. Um, that looking at that parallel back squat for men and women, that once you reach around that 1.7% 1.7 times your body weight, that is where the sweet spot in terms of anything after that is um, there is no gains in terms of speed. Okay, squat is a huge factor in developing speed up to a point. Once you go past that 1.7% times your body weight, then speed doesn't improve. And the, the actual the amount of work that you're going to have to put in to improve that is massive. And as you can see here, we can say to ourselves, okay, it's unnecessary. You don't need to do it. I'm happy you get up to a 1.7. That's where you need to be. That's when all your outputs are good. After that, don't bother. It's a waste of time in to be pretty crude about it. Similar for the deadlift, similar for the bench press. And again, these are kind of, some of this is excellent research. Some of it is a little bit still to be um, complete. And some of it is just kind of my own general opinion, what I've seen, particularly from the female point of view and from Camogian ladies football. I, uh, it's, shall I say, they're, they're still kind of gathering data. And I see that the gains that ladies football has made in the last couple of years is massive. Camogie is coming, but it's still a little bit behind. Um, so I still think these outputs could improve. The male, the male were probably a little bit ahead. It's still not perfect. But again, you're hitting these figures, you know you're in, you're in a good um, state. So I hope some of that makes sense and you can take some points from it. Um, I'm sorry I've gone over time here now, so I presume you won't want to, too many questions and answers. Um, but again, that's kind of where I'm at. You can kind of text me or email if you have any questions. If you don't want to ask them here, I'm happy to help. Um, as I said, that's kind of it. I know, Ken, I don't know, do you want to say anything there before we let people go? Is there any questions in? So I'll just give a kind of 30 seconds there then if anybody's any questions, otherwise we'll let you all go. I've kept you here nearly too long and I apologize for it. My email is, um, if you have a pen and paper, it's mark.brennan. I'll, I'll write it into the chat here actually for you there. It'll probably be the easiest thing to do. Um, so I'll write that in again. If anyone else has any other questions, you can throw them in there. Okay, so again, no questions. That's probably a, that's a good or a bad thing. But I, I hope that helped. Oh, sorry, one question coming in here. Um, a small sided non contact game. So, Carl, yeah, I, good question. Um, I know Ken was asked that last week as well. I, I probably would, st there, I don't, haven't seen any really good condition games. I've seen probably a lot of people kind of. Um, 
saying we should do this or this, that and the other. And I've tried a few of them and it just don't work. So what I've tried to do is do a lot of kind of, we call them, there are drills, but they're kind of conditioned drills, maybe where we've got certain players working in maybe for 30 seconds. And if, if from a hurling point of view, maybe they have to do, they've got six letters, okay, and they have to pick up a ball and hand pass and then strike it and over the ball. And then they have to come back and it's like an interchanging one. And they're working very hard for 30 seconds, getting all the skills in, but there isn't, re- isn't really any contact in it. Um, uh, look, I, I, I don't want to, to dismiss the question. I, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I have not seen any good good non-contact games, specific condition games. So that's really where we're just going back to all this, the drills, 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 and trying to find some some really good drills that are out there. Um, it's a good question. I, I'm just still trying to find the answer, and hopefully we don't have to spend too much time when we get back actually trying to come up with some of these these non-contact games. So again, if, if nobody else has any questions, we might leave it there, folks. Um, th- thanks very much again for taking your time, and sorry for, for going over time. I hope some of that made sense. Um, and hopefully I'll see you around Kula or around, see some of your affiliates around Old Lachlan in the next couple of weeks, please, God, when we're back out onto the pitch. So again, thanks very much, and uh, see you all soon. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.